Welcome everyone to the eMedica GP Training 2022 Next Steps webinar. For those that haven't met me before, a brief introduction. My name is Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP based here in Birmingham and Solihull. So that means I'm a GP with multiple roles. So I'm a partner in my own practice. One of the lead GPs at a secure unit for women with significant mental health illness. Um, I've held various other clinical roles over the years, including um, working in community detox, um, doing medicals for the army as a civilian medical practitioner. And then my main role now is a consultant in medical education and medical director of eMedica. So I teach, and some of you came to our courses to help you get through your MSRA or getting into GP training, but actually a bulk of what we teach is MRCGP uh, careers um, and, and so on. Uh, I did my own GP training in Neathport Talbot in South Wales. Um, I finished that in 2007. And our team at eMedica have been supporting GP trainees now for over 16 years, and I've trained over 60,000 delegates. So, so the program today, I'm going to start by highlighting some basics about your offer. Then we're going to talk about rotations in GP training, and then key things to do before you start training, including the pre-employment checks, different bits of paperwork, and I'll actually show you how to fill in some of the forms that are a bit more complex. Then I'm just going to touch on an overview of what to expect when you start training. We haven't got time to go into that in detail. We've got separate courses for that. But I'll touch on an overview of the structure of GP training and the three parts of MRCGP, just so you've got an idea. And then the last thing before the q and I'll talk to you about the GPST Plus course. This is a course that has been running now for 15 plus years, and it really is everything that you need to know before you start training to help you get the most out of your three years of training, and really maximize every rotation, maximize the time that you spend in training. Before we get into it, I just want to say a huge congratulations. I know personally, because a lot of you have uh, you know, posted in the group or asked me questions or uh, you know, I might have interacted with you through online revision or the courses, but I know how hard you've all worked. And this year has been the most competitive year ever for GP training the most number of applications, the most number of people that passed. And so, you know, there's lots of people that unfortunately, even if they've passed, didn't get a job in the area they wanted or didn't get an offer at all because just the competition was so hard this year. So well done. The fact that you've got in and all of your hard work, it's really, really, you know, you should be really proud of yourself that all that hard work and sacrifice that you made has paid off. So well done. Okay. So let's get into it. So in terms of the offer basics, now the information on, who's been allocated where and the accepted offers has now been passed to the deaneries and the lead employers. From this point in, you see previously it was a national process, right? But from this point in, now that the information has been passed on to the deaneries, each deanery has their own process. And that's why some of you might have seen that some of your friends have actually already know the exact rotations that they're gonna be starting in August, where some of you have had no contact at all from your deanery. That's because it's now up to each deanery and they each have their own timeline. Some are busier than others, some have different timelines. So some of you might not hear anything at all from your deaneries for a few weeks still. You might not hear until May. That's completely normal. Don't panic, nothing to worry about. It's just that each deanery has got their own timeline. Okay, so you don't have to do anything. You just have to relax, right? Now, when they do contact you, they're going to send you lots and lots of emails and there'll be lots of detailed information. Please read the information provided carefully. I'm going to cover the things that are going to happen everywhere and some things that are common to all deaneries. But there are some things where the process is specific to that deanery. And anything where you've got a query that's specific to your deanery, contact your deanery. Because, you know, um, asking me to give you or looking at the GP recruitment website where there's national information might not give you answers to things that are quite specific and local to that area. All right. The other thing that you can do is ask in the GP training support group. Why? Because there may be someone else in the same deanery who's already had the similar query and got a response. And so, you know, that can be useful. Okay, that's what the group's there for. Again, someone in the team will post links to both the contacts for all deaneries, which is via the GP recruitment website, so there's a page here, which we'll post a link to. And if you click into each of these deaneries, you can then find information about specific areas. But we'll also post a link to the GP uh, training support website on Facebook. If you're not already a member of that group, it's the largest group for GP training worldwide, actually. But, uh, you know, you find someone, hopefully, that can give you specific information if you've got a query for your deanery. So let's get into the main program then. And I want to start talking about rotations in GP training. What do you think? is the most important non-GP rotation to do as part of GP training. Of course, the most important thing is going to be the time you spend in general practice. You're training to become a GP. Most of you will only get two or three rotations because of, especially a lot of you are going to only have one year in hospital now and you'll have two years in GP. And so if you have six-month rotations, you might only get two. If you have four-month rotations, you might only get three rotations. Um, 
So nobody's going to get all the things that they want or all the things that would help them when they become GPs. So a lot of people think that A&E and PEDS would be really, really helpful. Less popular musculoskeletal. That's really interesting. I actually found that one of my most helpful rotations, um, rheumatology. Um, and then again, not that many people have picked ENT, eyes and dermatology. Probably more than 10% of all of your consultations in GP will involve skin conditions. Most people don't get a dermatology rotation, but actually it'd be tremendously helpful to do dermatology if you can. A couple of things that I will share with you from personal experience and experience of talking to doctors over many years. Um, so w- one is that doing certain specialties in hospital, while it might sound really helpful, the reality of it can be different. A good example of that is obstetrics and gynecology. You know, half our patients are going to be female. We're going to deal with a lot of obstetrics and gynecology as GPs. But a hospital obstetrics and gynecology rotation, the things that you see there, often it's a lot of ward work. And then when you're in theatre, often it's assisting with things like C-sections, which isn't that relevant to GP. What can be helpful is if you can get to clinics. So what a lot of people find is, you know, that they do an obstetrics and gynecology rotation, And a lot of the day-to-day work doesn't actually relate that much to what you're going to be seeing in GP. Whereas PEDS, again, was one of the most useful rotations I did as a hospital doctor. And even though the spectrum of things that we're going to see in PEDS in hospital might be slightly different, almost all of those have come in having seen a GP. So seeing which are the sick ones that need to end up in hospital, which are the ones that, you know, after being in hospital and being observed for a while can be sent by getting comfortable examining children dealing with sick children, but also communicating with parents as well as children. That's such a useful skill because, again, I would say, depending on which practice you are in, you know, maybe a fifth of your consultations are going to relate to child health once you're in in general practice. You know, uh, some of the practices I work at, um, nearly every other child, uh, every other patient I see is a child. Okay, A&E can be very helpful in that a lot of the things that you see in A&E, they're general, they're unselected cases, right? But also a lot of things that turn up to Amy actually sh- should be GP things, but it's just patients didn't want to uh, wait for an appointment for their GP. They just, you know, turned up to a and sometimes. Um, so, you know, that can be helpful. The downside of a and can often be the fact that the road is really busy. You have lots of nights, lots of weekends, lots of odd shifts. OK, care of the elderly. Very, very helpful. Again, if you've not done a medical job, getting used to seeing lots of Acute medical things can help you get more confident in dealing with sick patients. Psychiatry is another one where the clinic part of psychiatry, very, very helpful. A lot of the inpatient work in psychiatry, very different to the psychiatry that you're going to see as a GP. Um, The skills you'll learn from doing musculoskeletal orthopedics, I actually did orthopedics for a couple of years before I changed to general practice. And the skills I learned there, and you know, things like doing joint injections and getting comfortable examining joints, we see a lot of musculoskeletal problems in general practice. Okay. Um, dermatology, again, one of the most useful jobs that I did um, during training because we see so much skin conditions uh, in GP. Very few people get ENT eyes or eyes, but if you can, that can be very, very helpful. And then again, palliative care. In GP, a lot of the palliative care is delivered by GPs because a lot of patients who are for palliation, they choose to stay at home. And if we can support them to have a good death, it's one of the most beautiful things in medicine is that, you know, if you can help support someone stay in their own home, but be comfortable and symptom free. Okay. And after I did orthopedics, I I left medicine for a while. I I was planning to do something else. I I went and did a master's, but what brought me back into clinical medicine, I took a job in when I was doing my dissertation for my master's, I didn't have to attend anymore. I was working on a project. So I took a full-time job at a hospice and I fell back in love with clinical medicine. The best job I've done outside of GP was uh, palliative medicine. Um, and you know, lots of other things. The big thing I want you to take is that you can see every job can be beneficial if you have the right mindset, but every job might be some things where, you know, there's an element of service, isn't there? There might be some things where you don't see that there's that much relevance and you just got to sort of get through that. Okay. And sometimes some of the downsides of some of the jobs, which are got useful content can be that it can be really busy. Medical jobs are really busy. PEDS, really busy. a and really busy. Okay, you see. So in terms of ranking rotations, as I mentioned earlier, and as you saw, each deanery has a specific process and timeline. How they do it is different. Some of the things that you see, you might see when you get asked to choose rotations, if you might not be familiar with them, I just want to give you some of the words and what they mean. So ITP, 
sometimes described as an innovative post or a DSP, a dedicated skills post. ITP stands for integrated training program or integrated training post. This is where you have a split post. You spend some of the week in GP and some of the week in hospital. I actually did one of the first pilots, one of the first programs ever. This was like 17 odd years ago when they first launched these um, in Neathport Tubbs. Why I picked that? Because I'd done lots of hospital jobs before and I thought this would be um, a good way to get exposure to more GP. And so like, I spent part of my week in a GP practice. And then part of my week, I had over a year, three, four month rotation. So, I, you know, I'd spent part of the week doing GP. Part of the week I did uh, rheumatology, musculoskeletal learned key skills, was doing my own clinics by the end of it. Then I did uh, part of the week in GP, part of the week in dermatology. Again, really, really useful. And then I did part of the week in GP, part of the week in A&E, and I got the benefits of A&E, but I wasn't part of the normal on-call rotor, so I didn't need to do nights and weekends unless I chose to. And I did just a few just because you see a different range of cases and it's useful. Um, so if you can get access to integrated training programs, that can be a really, really useful way to get exposure to things that you might not otherwise get exposed to. Because often with these, you're not part of the normal on-call rotor, although you might be in some posts. So like in my case, when I did musculoskeletal, I was just in clinic learning. I wasn't doing normal ward work most of the time, similarly with dermatology and A&E. Um, some of you might get allocated to heft or trailblazer posts. There's a lot of variations, only a few deaneries that offer these, but they're typically areas where there might be either high deprivation or additional needs. For example, you might be working with patients, um, uh, you know, who are homeless or uh, migrant communities or, you know, patients um, with addiction issues. And if you're on the HEFT program, then as well as your normal GP training, there's additional e-learning. And they mentioned themselves that there's additional challenge. One of the things I'll post is there's a link to some more information about heft. This is all the information there is out there. There's not many people that can tell you what it's going to be like because it's the first year that heft has existed. There were trailblazer posts in the past, but they were different, okay? And in terms of the ranking and preferencing, in most cases, you'll be asked to do that via Oriel. They'll send you an email. So watch out for, you know, check your spam folders. Sometimes I'll, some deaneries just ask you to do it by, by email. And what I'd recommend you do is rank all rotations. So I'll show you what it might look like. So sometimes you'll see an Oriel, something like this, wanted, not wanted, and just a list of numbers. And you might think, oh, what does that mean? I, I don't know what I mean. In some cases, if you click this, it will tell you. In a lot of cases, what will happen is they'll send you separately via email, and it's gone into your junk and you didn't see an Excel sheet where you can see this is number one, this is number 21, this is number six. That Each of those numbers will relate to, so this one is GP first, then medicine, then GP, and then the, the third year, you know, like this might be, for example, that the first rotation, second rotation, third rotation, the second year might be in GP full time, third year might be in GP full time, or might be decided later. Okay. Um, so you know, you'll see something like this. So if you can see this but can't see what they mean, check your spam. If not, contact the deanery. Again, I posted the link earlier to where you can get contact details for your deanery or reply to the email that they sent you to get hold of the Excel. A post in the group, someone might have the Excel. All right. So how to actually rank, you know, what to pick? Two ways to pick things. One is if there's things that you don't have exposure or confidence in. So let's say you've never done uh, a pediatrics job. You're gonna see lots of children. If you can get exposure to peds, it's really helpful. Let's say you've never done derm and you don't feel confident with skin conditions. Or you've never done musculoskeletal. You don't feel comfortable, confident to do joint injections. You know, get exposure to things that you're gonna see, but you already don't have exposure to. The other way to pick things are things that you have a particular interest in and you think that later on you'd like to develop this. So let's say like long term, you think, you know, what I'd really like to develop a special interest in women's health. Then if you can do a women's health job and start getting exposure and making connections, that can be helpful. OK, just remember that because you're only going to get two, three, maybe four rotations in hospital, that nobody will get exposure to all the specialties that you want or that will be useful to you as a GP because we see everything in GP. You can see all of the things I mentioned and more would be helpful as a GP. And all rotation can be valuable if you have the right approach. If you look at it from, okay, as a GP, what are the things I need to take? If you map it to the GP curriculum and think, okay, what skills will be helpful? Or when someone's been referred in, okay, now we're dealing with the hospital side of things, but look, let me read the referral letter and see what the GP saw that made them send this patient in. Then you can take from it. Whereas 
if you just look at the fact that in every job there is some service provision and you know you're doing things like doing bloods and cannulating patients and rewriting drug charts and you know what there's not much gp relevant learning here you just have to accept that's part of the job but if you just sort of can only see that and don't proactively look at how can i take the learning from this you might find that you don't get anything out of any rotation, even the ones that actually someone else could do in the same hospital and get lots of value as a future GP, okay? And you have to actively think about how can I get exposure to all the specialties that I'm missing? Because what you don't wanna do is finish your GP training. You've only had exposure to a few things. You qualify as a GP. You haven't got to train anymore. Someone to ask you know, about every patient you're unsure of you're qualified and you're seeing things and you're sort of like a little bit lost. And so be proactive during training when you have study budget and study leave and, you know, um, things like that to actually get exposed. So how can you get exposure? Well, you can proactively start reading, doing some e-learning. So if you know, for example, I haven't got a women's health job, let me start doing some reading and e-learning about that. You could choose to do additional certificates, diplomas or certificates to fill in those gaps in knowledge and gain that confidence and skills. When you're in a GP training post, not in hospital, when you're in GP, you get one session, so one half day each week for self-directed learning. This is not time off. This is time for you to actually fill in some of those gaps. So, for example, you might say, approach a local consultant in obstetrics and gynecology if you haven't got a women's health job and say, you know, would you mind if I sit in on your clinics one afternoon a week for the next six weeks? And then you get that signed off by your trainer. They're happy for you to do that. And then you might spend a few weeks going and sitting in ENT clinics or dermatology clinics or go to a hospice and do some palliative care. You know, make use of that time because you don't get that when you're in hospital. But also when you're qualified, you're not going to have that time. When you're seeing patients during GP posts, try to learn from every patient encounter. Read up about it. You know, what you don't know, ask about it. Uh, read the relevant guidelines. So you're constantly learning. There'll be lots of things at the beginning which you're not sure about. Ask your trainer. Read up. Learn. And then use things like your study leave and your study budget and your own time to go on courses to fill in gaps, okay? And a lot of doctors have had this issue that, you know, they, I'll give you an example. Someone who had done a &E before and they still, they didn't want a &E, they still ended up with a &E as one of their hospital rotations. And then one of them was medicine and they'd done medicine before and they only got one that they really, really wanted, okay? And so they didn't get exposure to ENT or dermatology or women's health or optum, you know, to fill in those gaps. That's one of the reasons we specifically launched a national GP trainee conference to help people fill in some of these gaps it's called GP Training Live. Um, and really it draws trainees from all over the UK in ST1, ST2 and ST3. And we have, you know, a program of education. It's a long day, covers seven CPD credits. But it's also an opportunity to meet other people in different deaneries at different stages of training. So we have GP focus workshops. We have careers um, talks. We held it live in Birmingham in 2019, London 2020. Last year it was live stream because of COVID. This year we're going back, and I'm really excited, we're going back to live. Save this day, 3rd of September. It'll be live in Birmingham, but there'll also be a live stream for those that can't join. So, for example, this is Birmingham 2019. So we had a talk on... Um, this is a consultant psychiatrist, did a talk on psychiatry for GPs, okay? Um, this is a consultant dermatologist. So this is Dr. Daniel Jackson. Uh, this is Dr. Avad Mughal. He done a really popular talk and he's actually coming this year again to do um, the top 10 skin conditions and key skills in dermatology for GPs. So, you know, all of these workshops are focused for GPs, but they're done with people with the right expertise. This is Dr. Nigga Arif. She's a portfolio GP. Some of you might have seen her. She's on BBC. She's got a radio show. But she's also a GP with special interest in women's health. So she did our Women's Health for GPs workshop. Um, I did uh, sessions on careers. Um, and I've also done sessions on AKT and the exams and, and so, trainees in difficulty and how to get through that. This is Dr. Im, Im, or Mr. Imran Khan. He's a consultant ophthalmologist. He's done a session for us on ophthalmology for GPs. This was the London event. Um, so this is other sessions we've had, ENT for GPs, pediatrics for GPs we had last year. Okay, so let's move on to the other key things you need to do before training. So you will get an email from your lead employer or deanery. And one of the first things you're going to be asked to do is to confirm or claim your job. Typically, this is done via the NHS job site called Tracks. Okay, and so they'll ask you to set up an account, make sure you use the same email that you used when you used your Oriel application. So they'll be able to match and find you. Okay. And within that, 
there'll be a whole lot of tasks that you need to do. So things like it will show you if all your references are back. Okay. If your references aren't back by the deadline of the 25th, what will happen is it will just be passed on to the lead employer and they will pursue them. In most cases, if they get two that are satisfactory, if the third one, you know, they're still finding tr trouble tracking it down, they might accept it. Sometimes they will insist on all three. Sometimes they might ask for another reference, even if you've already had three accepted, they might ask for another one from your current job, just so they've got one that's really, really um, relevant. Something else that you'll be asked to do is an enhanced DBS. DBS is disclosure and barring service, it's basically a police check. And what they will do is they will do a police check looking at if you've had any convictions, any um, you know, activity they need to be aware of. So it's a really important practical tip. Once you've completed this, and as part of this, you'll have to attend, those of you that are outside the UK, you won't be able to start this until you get to the UK. This is why you'll find the lead employer will probably ask you to try to arrive about a month before you're due to start, because it can take about a month for this to be processed, because you'll need to actually physically attend and show your ID documents to get this going. OK, um, and one of the things that after this comes back, within 30 days, you have an option to register for the update service. Please register for the update service. It's only £13 a year. If you miss the 30 day deadline, you can't register for the update service. Why is this important? Because some of you might work in different hospitals as part of your training. If you're not in the update service, every time you change to a different hospital, you're going to have to do a new DBS and go and show your ID. And often after the first one, you'll have to pay for it. It can cost 50, 60 pounds. OK. Um, similarly, when you go from hospital to GP, you'll have to do a new one. Unless you're on the update service. If you're on the update service, you get given a DBS number. And all you need to do is give them the number and you don't need to go and show all your documentation. And they basically can check it live if you're on the update service. If you're not registered with the update service, and you can only do that within 30 days. Occupational health. So they'll ask for things like your proof of vaccinations and so on. And then I want to talk about these ones in a bit more detail. So ALS or EALS, you know, CPR, the ones that are uh, recognised in the UK are from Resuscitation UK, EU, Australia. And then I want to go through the lead employer forms and form R. So I get a lot of people asking about whether or not they need an ALS certificate or ELS certificate. Um, and I think a lot of people, because this year they didn't ask you to submit a certificate as part of the application, they thought that you don't need it at all. That's not the case, okay? They just didn't require you to submit a certificate. This is part of the F2 competencies for those that are in foundation, but it's also part of the crest for those that are not in foundation, okay? Look what it says. One of the essential criteria that you demonstrate the performance of advanced life support, including CPR, DFib, management of arrhythmias, and is able to lead the resuscitation team where necessary. And there's a note, an ALS course alone is insufficient evidence to demonstrate this capability. You see, what it's saying is just doing the course and having a certificate isn't enough. You need to have done it in real life and someone observed that you're competent and if necessary, that you can lead the team. Now, some deaneries last year, because it was difficult to get on ALS course, a lot of them were canceled because of the pandemic. Some deaneries last year allowed people to start and to do it later. This year, some deaneries, they've not asked you to provide a certificate, but you've already have confirmed that you're competent if you've had your crest signed. And if you're in foundation, you need to be competent by the time you start. And so what some deaneries will do is we'll actually ask for a certificate. Some might not ask for a certificate, but expect you to be competent. Remember, if you're starting in a hospital job, week one, you might be part of the cardiac arrest team. If you're not competent and you've been signed off as competent and then you, now you're not able to do it, that could put you in a really difficult situation. So if you're not sure if your deanery will request an actual certificate, contact them. Again, we posted where to get the deanery contacts earlier. I know certainly some deaneries, the program director has said, if you don't have the certificate, you're not going to be able to start. Others have said, OK, you might not be able to be on call uh, until it's done. So if you haven't already got an ALS certificate, or if you don't have the competency, please book a course as soon as possible because they're really, really important skill, okay? You don't wanna be in a situation where you're in the cardiac arrest team and you're not able to do this and then someone comes to harm, okay? So that's really, really important. Right, then the lead employer forms. Now something again about this that can cause confusion. Your lead employer is not necessarily where you're working. Some of you might be working in Birmingham, but your lead employer is St. Helens and Knowsley NHS Trust. 
which is in a completely different part of the country. So sometimes people get an email from these people. St. Helens and Nosley are the lead employer for many deaneries in England. Okay. And so people get confused. They think, oh, they've given me the wrong offer. I didn't, I didn't want an upgrade. I didn't want this place. I wanted Birmingham. Don't worry. Your offer is where you accepted. Your lead employer isn't necessarily where you actually employed. They're, they're just going to handle your salary, your payroll, and deal with the employment forms. Where you're actually working is your deanery. Okay. Sometimes, though, in some areas, the lead employer will be the deanery or the health board or the, the trust, depending where you are in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Okay. So, th again, the forms that they request might all look slightly different because each lead employer has different forms. Okay. So, let's look at the typical forms, the things that you all need to be aware of. And then I'll show you some examples. I said there might be slight differences. Some of you might see things, they look a little bit different. If you've got specific queries, contact them. Okay. So, things that they will typically ask you to do is to send in a copy of your last appraisal if you're in a non training post or your last ARCP if you're transferring to GP from a training post. Okay. Usually this is in something called Form R Part B or the equivalent in Scotland is called SOAR, okay? Now, if you've not worked in the NHS or you've not had a first NHS appraisal, just complete the forms that they ask you based on whatever you've done in the last 12 months. There will be a training agreement where you actually agree to meet the requirements of training. And then there's two forms that are important. So this one that I've talked about is, is usually part of Form R Part B. The one that you're all going to need to complete is Form R Part A, unless you're in Scotland. In Scotland, by completing all of the required information, which is similar information to what we're going to put in Form R Part A outside of Scotland, on a website called Churas. Okay, that's the equivalent of Form R Part A. And then within Churas, the equivalent of Form R Part B in Scotland is called SOAR form. Form R Part A and the initial registration with Churas, you just do once before you start training. Form R Part B, you'll do now. And then you'll do every single year before your ARCP. ARCP is annual review that you're meeting your checkpoints. You'll do this every year until you complete training. Okay. So you're all going to do form R part A or complete to us now. Form R part B and complete SOAR once now. But these ones you'll then do every single year. Okay. So I'm going to show you form R part A first. In detail, I've filled in some of the bits so that it, um, you know, will save us a bit of time. Now, again, there's slight variation by deanery or lead employer. In some cases, you'll be asked to fill it in using Adobe Acrobat. Some deaneries have an online form. For example, London KSS this year, they just got an online version where you just fill in the things on a web page rather than uh, on a downloaded form. In Scotland, you don't fill in form R part A. You just complete the equivalent information on the Touraz website. They'll send you a link to register for that. So here's form R part A. OK, so, you know, some bits are very straightforward. You know, you just put in your details, your GMC, your date of birth, your gender. A couple of things here, your deanery or HE local team. So, like, for example, here I've selected West Midlands. That's where I'm working. You know, some of you are going to pick Northeast England or Northwest, you know, wherever you're going to be training. OK, this bit here, your Im current immigration status, not what you're going to be in August, your current status, the day you fill in the form. So, for example, if you are a UK citizen, if you're British, or you're already a resident, you put down resident, okay? Similarly, you know, someone who's got ILR, you know, you're settled. If you're going to need a work permit, if you're going to need a tier two visa, if you're going to need sponsorship, then you put work permit required, okay? Then your main medical qualification, so some of you have MBBS, I have MBBCH, the date you got it, so I got mine in 2001, 21 years ago nearly, okay? Your medical school. So I went to the University of Wales College of Medicine. OK, your home address. In some cases, you'd be asked to uh, put in a picture here. So you can only do this as an online thing if you're using Acrobat Reader. So make sure you download the right form. Right. So look, I click here. I browse. I find the right image. And then it adds the image. OK. Program specialty. General practice. So just search down here. General practice. Specialty one, general practice. Specialty two, leave it blank. Royal College, RCGP. All of you are going to select this option here. You know, there's a whole load of options here. It can be confusing. You're going to select the option of CCT. Okay. And then start date is the 3rd of August. If you've not applied for deferral, this is the standard starting date for everyone starting August 2022. It's the 3rd of August. 
If you're doing full time, it's three years. The finish date will be the first Tuesday in August 2025. So it's the 5th of August 2025. And then the post type is run through. Okay. GP training is a run through specialty. And then here, if you're full time, just put full time. If you're 80% and you had that approved, put 80%. If you and so on. Okay. So like I'm, let's say I'm going to do full time. This is today's date. Here you can sign your name electronically and then leave the last bit blank. So that's formal part A. Okay. Formal part B, I'm just going to show you the main bit that you need to fill in. Just if I can make this a little bit smaller so we can fill it in. All right. Okay. So like all of this, just your normal details. Make sure you put the same DNV that you put in formal part A here. Okay. Um, if you've not worked in the NHS before, your previous designated body, you might not have one. You can put NA. For anything where you don't have, you can put N stroke A, not applicable, okay? For those of you that, for example, are in foundation now, your previous designated body would be your foundation school, okay? Um, or in some cases, it might be the trust that you're working at now. If you got a current revalidation date, you can find this by logging into your GMC account. It will say your revalidation date. Um, if you've already been revalidated, let's say someone's already done a lot of training, you might have already been revalidated once. I've been revalidated three times already, you know, after I've qualified every five years, I've already done 15 years of revalidation, okay? The training specialty is GP, leave this blank. None of you are doing dual specialty, it's not possible with GP, okay? And then this is the bit where you put all of the jobs that you've done in the last 12 months, because it says since last ARCP, if you're in training, if you're not in training, they still want you to fill in, just fill in the last 12 months and then leave it blank. And then the rest of the form is self-explanatory. So it's things like, you know, um, do you have any GMC conditions? Do you have any health conditions? Do you have any convictions? Things like that, okay? Uh, most of that, you don't need to really worry about now. It's after you coming up to a year in training, before your ARCP, you're gonna have to fill it in. Similarly, you're gonna have to fill in before you come up to your first ARCP, which will be about June next year you'll fill in any days you had off in the first 12 months of training. You'll also have to fill in details of any locum work within the last 12 months that goes in here. Any locum sessions, you have to fill that in and you do that during training as well every year, okay? As I mentioned, the equivalent of Formar Part A is filling in Turas in Scotland and the equivalent of Formar Part B is filling in this SOAR form, which is part of Turas in Scotland, okay? So that's some of the pre-employment things, as I said, your dinner will be in touch. Keep an eye on your email, keep an eye on your spam, and then just read it carefully, follow the instructions. Anything you don't understand, reply to their email or post in the group for help, okay? Because the things that are specific to the deanery, you know, the deanery can tell you about. So I wanna give you an overview now of GP training and of um, MRC GP. Then I wanna tell you about how the GPST Plus can, course can help you. So some of you will have four month rotation. Some of you will have six month rotation for your hospital or GP jobs in year one and year two. Year three, all of you, the full year will be in GP. So in most deaneries now, you'll have 12 months hospital, two years GP. Some deaneries still have 18 months hospital, 18 months GP. Some of you, you'll have those innovative schemes. So you'll have a year full-time in hospital. You'll have a year where you're half of the week in GP, half of the week in hospital, and then a year full-time in GP. Okay, so there's a lot of variation. Um, so, you know, again, just wait for the details of that, but that gives you an idea of what to expect. So I just want to give you the briefest overview of MRCGP, just so you have a base idea about this. So MRCGP is a compulsory exit exam for GP specialty training. To qualify as a GP and get your certificate of completion of training, you have to get through all three parts of MRCGP. So the first is workplace-based assessment. This starts from the first week you start in training and runs until the end of training in year three. AKT is the Applied Knowledge Test. This is a 200 question exam. You do 200 questions in three hours and 10 minutes and it's done on computer. It's 80% clinical medicine relevant to GP, 10% statistics, research, evidence-based medicine, and 10% organizational and admin topics relevant to GP. You can only sit this in ST2 or later. So you can't see any of the examined parts of MRCGP in year one of training, okay? And then currently in year three of training, ST3, you sit the RCA, the Recorded Consultant Consulting Assessment, where you record 13 real life consultations with real life patients and you submit them and the examiners observe and mark 
your history and examination skills, your diagnosis and management skills, and your communication skills. And based on how you perform in 13 cases, real life patients that you submit, you either pass or fail the exam, okay? Currently, they are working on a new exam. The RCA was brought in because of the pandemic. Before that, doctors used to go to London to the actual Royal College building and do a simulated surgery with 13 actors where they would do consultations where they would be assessed on the same things, history, examination, diagnosis, management, interpersonal communication skills, but with simulators. That wasn't possible to run during the pandemic. So what they're working on now is a hybrid exam where you might be submitting some real life consultations and doing some standardized consultations with simulated patients. By the time you guys that are starting training now get to ST3 and sit the exam, that will have the full details of the hybrid exam because that's likely to be launched by the end of next year. OK, so we'll know more details, but the skills it will test will be the same. We just don't know the exact details of the format. OK, so the main thing that you need to worry about this stage as you're starting training is workplace based assessment, because you can't sit this now. You can't sit this now. OK, so in terms of workplace based assessment, you'll have an e-portfolio specific to GP training. You can't access it until you're in GP training and it will be used to have ongoing assessments throughout all three years. There's a whole load of different assessment tools. There's different 10 different types of learning logs and there's certain checkpoints that, you know, you need to meet these checkpoints at the end of ST1. Otherwise you won't be able to go into ST2. By the end of ST2, you need to meet certain checkpoints to be able to get into ST3 and so on. So that all these different assessments, there's all these new assessments, and then there's, you know, various other checkpoints. And that brings me on to the GPST plus course because a lot of doctors are overwhelmed when they start training with workplace-based assessment and all of these things that a lot of them they're not familiar with. So that's where this course came about, really. It's that this course helps anyone that wants to start training with a clear plan for the three years and already with the tools to hit the ground running on day one, that you don't want to be overwhelmed by these things. OK, so, you know, we have detailed coverage of the e-portfolio. What are the 10 different types of learning? What types of learning to put where? How to write a concise clinical case review, which is the most important type of learning log, how to write a, a personal development plan, which you need to do for each rotation. What are the new assessment tools? What are the checkpoints at ST1, ST2, ST3? What are the different ARCP outcomes? How can you avoid getting into trouble in ARCP and make sure you get the outcomes that you want? We'll also go into more detail about MRC, GP, AKT and do some sample questions, look at why people fail and how to avoid it, how to prepare, when to sit it. We'll look at the MRC, GP, RCA and the hybrid exam and practice some cases and look at, again, why people fail. We'll look at courses that you can do during training to help you cover some of these things that we talked about, like DCH, DFSRH, DRCOG, minor surgery, the stiff course for sexual health, drug misuse. We'll look at the GP registrar contract in detail. So salary scales, pay protection, annual leave entitlement, study leave, your working week. The GP contract when you're in a GP post, very different to hospital post. The pay is different too. Medical legal issues in GP. What are the reasons that people get complaints during GP training? Why might people be referred to the GMC? How can you avoid these things? How can you reduce the risk of getting complaints? What is a portfolio GP? How do you go about developing a portfolio career? Like I have lots of different roles. A lot of the GPs that I know have lots of different roles. What's a GP with specialist interest? How do you develop a specialist interest? You do that after you finish training, but there are some things you can do during training to get a head start. We'll cover that in detail. And then how to succeed in GP training. What are the key tips that are gonna help you really do well in every rotation throughout training and hit the ground running when you qualify too? So, it's a full day, 9.30 to 5.30. The live course is the 11th of June. You also get access to the full recording. So all of the modules as a recording afterwards for a month. And if you're not available on the day, you can just sign up to the recording, okay? Someone will post the links. Any of you that used eMedica for your MSRA preparation, you can actually join the eMedica Alumni Association and you can apply for one of 100 bursaries which will give you 100 pounds off the course. The course is normally 195 pounds. You could attend for 95 pounds if you used eMedica for MSRA. If you didn't, you know, you can still attend, but you'll pay the full price. Uh, there's 68 of the 100 left. So 32 are already gone. Um, so if you do want to come and you did use eMedica, join the Alumni Association. Someone will post a link to that. Um, and then use the code because once they're gone, you'll still be able to book, but you won't get the discount. You know, you'll pay the, the full price. So, um, I'll show you where you find it on the website. If you look at the specialty training, it's here, the GPST Plus course. So you can book here. Um, and if you click here, for those that are 
use the Medicaid. If you fill this form in, you'll get the, the, the details for the bursary. Code. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it gives you a clearer idea of some of the things that are going to happen in the next steps before you start training. And all of us at eMedic would like to wish you every success in your training and your career. We're here to support you. You know, we've been supporting GP trainees and qualified GPs for 15, 16 plus years now. Okay, so have a great evening and I'll see you soon. Well done again on getting into training.